Welcome to the panel session on the Mauritius Investment uh, Summit. So my name is Shamima Malam Hassam, and I'm the chairperson of Mauritius Finance, the industry association that groups the players in the financial services sector in Mauritius. So I'll be moderating this session today, and uh, the Mauritius Investment Summit aims to present to you the investment opportunities in and through Mauritius, and to give an overview of those opportunities, we will have, first have the pleasure to uh, hear from the uh, Minister of Financial Services and Good Governance, Honorable Mahem Siratan, who will share his perspective. We will then have a panel discussion comprising of uh, bankers, uh, administrators, and also the Economic Development Board. So um, the time is very limited, so we have 40 minutes to be able to tell you about Mauritius and why Mauritius uh, for investing into the country and through. So I have the pleasure to invite the Honorable Minister to come on stage to deliver his address. Thank you. Thank you, Shamima. Uh, good morning to everyone. I must say I'm very delighted to welcome you all uh, to this morning's session on investing in Mauritius or investing in Africa through the Mauritius International Financial Center. Mauritius, a small island nation of just over 2,000 square kilometers, a small population of 1.3 million people, and no natural resources to exploit. Yet, Mauritius boasts one of the highest GDP per capita in Africa, and is on its way to become a high-income economy. FDI to Mauritius in 2022 stood at 27 billion rupees, which is roughly about 600 million billion US dollars, million dollars rather. And this year it is expected to reach 30 billion rupees, which is about 630 million US dollars. Ladies and gentlemen, allow me to take you through the economic journey of Mauritius since its independence 55 years ago. At independence in 1968, the Mauritian economy was highly reliant on agriculture, a poor island where at the time two Nobel Prize winners in the persons of James Mead and V.S. Naipaul, gave no chance of success and condemned Mauritius to a future of no hope. Nobel Prize winning economist James Mead wrote in 1961, and I quote, it is going to be a great achievement if Mauritius can find productive employment for its population without a serious reduction in the existing standard of living, the outlook for peaceful development is weak, end of quote. On the other hand, in 1972, Nobel Literature Prize winner V.S. Naipaul wrote The Overcrowded Barracoon, portraying Mauritius as an overcrowded hellhole with no hope. Though Common sense justifies both of the Nobel Prize winners, but none counted on the fact that an island composed of migrants from across Africa, Europe, and Asia would unite into a harmonious rainbow nation with a vision of unity and diversity exemplified with the Mauritian motto, Lame de Lame, that is putting together, giving hand to each other and ensuring that as one nation, one people, Mauritians build a peace-loving nation embracing diversity, tolerance, and gratitude to set the base for a prosperous nation. With such a base, Mauritius embarked in its industrialization strategy in the late 1960s and early 70s to transform into a textile and apparel powerhouse by the mid 80s. The GDP per capita rose from 400 US dollars 
at independence time to 1,000 US dollars. The 1980s saw an era of further economic diversification in the hospitality sector, namely the tourism era. By the end of the decade, the GDP per capita already exceeded 2,000 US dollars. In 1992, Mauritius sets up the Mauritius IFC with the introduction of the Mauritius Offshore Business Activities Act. We then experienced high growth for almost a decade with the GDP per capita reaching USD 4,000 in the late 1980s, 1990s rather, and in 2001, another significant new economic pillar was established with the ICT BPO sector. Now, with five core economic pillars, Mauritius GDP grew significantly, reaching almost 8,000 US dollars by 2008. Over the years, the Mauritius IFC has revamped and re-engineered itself to encompass more substance and attract global players. Today, Mauritius continues to re-engineer its economic landscape through promoting high-tech high manufacturing, namely pharmaceutical products, medical devices, and high-end products such as jewelry. Another sector picking up in Mauritius is biotechnology and clinical trials, with major inroads being made to also transform Mauritius into a regional education hub and medical tourism. On the educational hub, I wish to highlight that today, several campuses operate in Mauritius, representing leading universities from Australia, the UK, France, Canada, and India. Over 2,000 students from Africa currently study in Mauritius, with the Mauritian government attributing up to 50 scholarships to African students annually. I further wish to highlight that once their study is completed, the students automatically get a three-year work permit in Mauritius to help complement the need for talents in several sectors, such as the financial services and the banking sector. Additionally, with the Mauritius IFC meeting all the standards as per the FATF, the EU, and the OECD, and with several bilateral agreements in place and across the globe, making Mauritius an attractive and efficient jurisdiction to multinational companies and high net worth individuals, significant investment in property development is also underway. Building communication infrastructures, such as new roads and bridges, linking all commercial areas across the island. Mauritius is already 100% fibered with, with high-speed internet available to all businesses and households. Ladies and gentlemen, for the past three years consecutively, the Mauritius Free Port has been ranked by the Global FDI Intelligence Magazine among the top 10 free, free zones globally and first in Africa. With prefer preferential market access to around 70% of the global market, the Mauritius Free Port is viewed as a huge opportunity linking organizations across India, China, Japan, Europe, the UK and the USA and Africa. To that end, extensive development of the road and rail network can be seen along with substantial investment in new commercial centers, warehouses, and industrial zones to enable regional trade. To complement the various sectoral growth, new residency schemes, such as the diaspora scheme, the premium residency visa, the investor visa, the innovator visa, or the professional visa are amongst the myriad of schemes to encourage high net worth individuals, professionals, investors, and innovators to work, live, 
and play in Mauritius. To that end, ladies and gentlemen, several high-end property developments with developers from across the global are currently underway to accommodate new high net worth individuals, families, and professionals looking to make Mauritius their new domicile. And I can assure you that we have taken all necessary actions to sustain their, this effort of continuously striving to provide the highest level of security, certainty, stability, and predictability. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm sure that the panelists after me will uh, at least try to elaborate more on the new structures for fund domiciliation, the VCC, and all, all what is having so significant impact to foundation and fund managers who are considering fund or funds for Africa. The Virtual Assets Initial Token Offering Services Act 2021, which is known as the VITOS, has five digital licenses firmly placing Mauritius on the global fintech landscape. These continuous re-engineering and revamping of the Mauritian economic landscape drives resilience and increase attractive, attractiveness of Mauritius as an economic jurisdiction. Ladies and gentlemen, allow me to share with you some of our, of our credentials as an investment platform. Today, Mauritius is ranked 13th in the World Bank Ease of Doing Business Index, 11th in the Economic World Freedom Index, first in the Murray Bryan Index for Governance, which are major indicators of the business-friendly environment for investors. Additionally, ladies and gentlemen, the inherent comparative advantage, advantages that Mauritius offers, such as no restrictions to capital flow, up to 95% tax exemption on selected structures for fund domiciliation, the hybrid legal system combining the best from French Code Civil along the British common law, and with the highest court of appeal being the King's Privy Council in the UK, Mauritius truly aspires to provide the risk mitigating ecosystems along with the platform, along, along with the professionalism, effectiveness, and efficiency sought by global professional and global investors. Today, several foreign foundations, family offices, and fund managers are actively working to establish new structures in the Mauritius IFC. Before I conclude, ladies and gentlemen, I wish to reiterate that as a diversified nation, Mauritius has successfully built on its tolerance and diverse cultural heritage to establish investment promotion and protection agreements, double taxation treaties, bilateral and multilateral trade treaties to today provide preferential access to around 70% of the world consumer market. This is why, ladies and gentlemen, Mauritius will play a decisive and impactful role and is leading the way as a platform for trade, investments, and capital raising for Africa. It is noteworthy that the Mauritius IFC is already key to driving quality foreign direct investments in the continent. Africa is actually the second largest destination for investment from Mauritius totaling 82 billion US dollars, representing 9% of overall foreign investment into the continent. Mauritius for Africa will continue to fulfill its promise of delivering on the Africa we want as envisioned in the African Union 
Commission's 2063 agenda. Ladies and gentlemen, at the level of my ministry, we are working towards setting up an ESG framework that will further enable impact investment across Africa. We are studying existing and new conventions and protocols to adopt that will reduce the cost of finance through the Cape Town Convention on financing of movable assets or increase intellectual property protection with the Patent Protection Treaty, amongst many others. For all these reasons, and so much more, I invite you to come and invest in Mauritius or in Africa through Mauritius. Ladies and gentlemen, on the compliance agenda, I'm proud to mention that our fiscal regime is compliant on the OECD standards and, the, and in the recent evaluation by the Eastern and Southern African, Africa Anti-Money Laundering, Laundering Group, ESAMLAG, Mauritius has been admitted in a select club. We are now the first and only country in Africa to be compliant on all the 40 FATF recommendations. So with these words, I wish to thank you and have the pleasure to give the floor to the excellent panelists with seasoned professionals on the, of the financial services sector to dwell further in Mauritius and investment in Mauritius and across Africa. So with these words, I thank you for your attention and give back the floor to Shamima. Thank you so much. Thank you, Honorable Minister, for sharing your, the trajectory of, the, of Mauritius and also on the IFC. I now have the pleasure to invite my panelists to join me on stage for an insightful discussion on the role and, uh, the, of, of the IFC and the investment to dwell into the investment opportunities in Mauritius. So, um, Raoul, Thierry, Nitin, Mahan, and Vinay, can you join me on stage, please? He hasn't got the mic. Sorry? You don't have mic? No. I think it's a need. Hmm? <laughs> so um, the Honorable Minister has mentioned and given an overview of how the Mauritian economy has evolved. Uh, and we, the panelists today, will try to elaborate a little bit more about, you know, uh, what uh, the investment, what is the investment landscape in Mauritius, but also on the aspect of using Mauritius to do business in Africa. So investment in and through Mauritius. So uh, to introduce my panel, so I have uh, here two bankers. So uh, Thierry is from the interim CEO of Africa Bank, and Raoul is the CEO of SBM Holdings. I have Vinay, who is from the Economic Development Board. So the Economic Development Board is the agency that drives the economic agenda in Mauritius and has been driving a lot of policies, reforms in the country. And I have Mahan and Nitin, who are from what we call corporate services provider, who are, plays an important role in Mauritius uh, in terms of advising and helping investors who would like to structure in Mauritius. So I'll start with uh, Vinay. Um, the Honorable Minister has mentioned about you know, how Mauritius has evolved from being a monocrop economy to a diversified economy. And the Economic Development Board pay, plays an important role in driving policies, in uh, looking at new sectors of development. Can you elaborate a little bit more about what are the new sectors that you know, the, the country is attracting investment in? And what make it appealing for people to come and, and invest in Mauritius? Thank you, Shamima. I think uh, building on what the Honorable Minister said, uh, certainly uh, 
If you would have recalled uh, in the 70s and 80s, it was about the industrialization process, textile manufacturing for that matter, uh, picked up and Mauritius became the third largest supplier of textile and apparel in the world at the time. Small Mauritius, can you imagine that? And uh, over time, as the GDP per capita went up, so the cost of production went up. So Mauritius had to industrialize, adopt new technologies. So now high-end manufacturing is being promoted across the island. So if you look like, for example, medical devices, catheters, I mean, for the large part of 25 years, the major export of Mauritius yes. to France and India were textile and apparel. Now it's uh, medical devices, catheters. So this is the re-engineering that's happening in Mauritius, where we're going up the value chain, making jewelry, making spare parts for watches and, and, and sunglasses, for example, that are exported through Agua to the USA. So it's about in, uh, manufacturing to high-tech uh, products, high-value products as well, so that the total cost of labor and the total cost of the supply chain, logistic uh, cost, doesn't matter much in the total cost of the product itself. So that's one area where there's investment. The other aspect as well as the minister mentioned, we have a lot of multilateral agreements and bilateral agreements when it comes to trade, giving us preferential market access to 70% of the world uh, market. And to that end, we've seen uh, the free port of Mauritius is becoming quite attractive to a lot of multinationals and operators from India, from France, from Japan, from China, looking at establishing in Mauritius uh, to further exploit uh, or explore and, and expand their technologies across uh, the continent, but also linking Asia and Africa from Mauritius as well. So we've seen, for example, Decathlon, which is the largest uh, supply chain entity in the uh, sports and apparel sector, they use Mauritius as the logistic platform for Africa and for Middle East as well. And now with the IFC of Mauritius uh, being quite relevant and significant, so we're seeing them doing the invoicing to all their 56 outlets across Africa and uh, Middle East through the Mauritian IFC as well. So these are some of the key developments, latest uh, investment that we are seeing in Mauritius. Another thing as well uh, is about clinical trials, biotechnology. L'Oreal has moved all the clinical trials to Mauritius recently. So we're seeing these are, are becoming quite significant because in, in Mauritius, the, uh, the population is quite educated. So it's easy to, to get resources, train them, and deliver at the highest standard. So we're seeing a lot of these happening. And of course, as the Honorable Minister is saying, we're also becoming attractive to high net worth individuals, over 4,000 dollar millionaires residing in Mauritius already for such a small island. And uh, we're seeing a lot of property development, high-end residency in Mauritius, uh, a lot of that uh, are part of the investment opportunity and landscape for Mauritius. Thank you, um, Vinay. Yeah. Mahan, I'll, I'd like to piggyback on, on, on that. And if you can probably give us your perspective on why Mauritius is interesting to channel or to structure investment through rather than going directly. So obviously mm -hmm. all the African countries or any countries for that matter have also their own advantages. But what makes it appealing for, for someone to use Mauritius and to structure its, invest, in, its investment through Mauritius? Yes, uh, thank you. Thank you, Shamima, for this question. Uh, and I think it's a great question because um, uh, hearing the panel, and there was a lot of panelists yesterday talking about what the investors are looking for. Uh, we're talking about obviously investing into Africa uh, which still is seen to be a continent which has a lot of risk. Mm. There's a lot of risk associated. There's a lot of perception of risk um, which are associated um, when dealing with Africa. And of, of course, Africa is not one country, 54 different countries, 54 different um, regimes um, in terms of uh, investment regimes that are happening. So the role of Mauritius, what we see is, is really to ensure that the investors have the comfort that they are investing in a jurisdiction which has been tried and tested for many years and which is very stable. Uh, the regulatory framework um, ensures that the, the whole ecosystem works in the favor of the investors, at least for capital preservation and capital appreciation. The investors have that comfort. If you look at the facts and figures, um, yeah, the, the, there are about a 1,000 funds um, which are regulated and domiciled in Mauritius. We have about 25,000 um, holding companies and cross-border uh, holding and trading companies which are uh, structured in Mauritius. The asset under administration uh, for, for all these structures amount to about $650 billion. 
uh, this is 50 times the GDP of Mauritius, right? So it's, there are very few countries and very few financial centers in the world which has this type of asset and administration. You see Singapore, which plays a big role for Asia Pacific, Luxembourg for, uh, for, for Europe. So Mauritius plays the same role for the region. Uh, it acts as a gateway and the catalyst for bringing the investment in, uh, structured to give the comfort to investors. Uh, the, the other element that we see a lot, and, and as the uh, Honorable Minister mentioned, uh, we're celebrating 30 years of the Mauritius International Financial Center this year. MITCO is celebrating 30 years as well. So we, we have been a pioneer in the sector. We've seen the evolution. Uh, it, Mauritius is also solving a problem for a lot of companies operating in Africa, because most of the countries in Africa have very tight exchange controls. It's very difficult to have movement of capital. Um, the banking sector in Mauritius is geared towards free movement of capital, uh, and, and a lot of companies um, in, who actually have to trade with the world have their trading center in Mauritius for procurement, for recognitions of sales, etc. I think uh, my colleagues from the banking sector will talk about it and how Mauritius play that key role to ensure that there is a uh, possibility to make payments uh, out of Mauritius through the bank. Um, the, I think Raul in his speech yesterday mentioned about the investment grade of Mauritius, which is extremely important yeah. from a trading perspective. We've seen major groups um, from South Africa, from India, and, and from Europe, uh, as well as from China, using Mauritius as a treasury center because you have the ability to uh, deal with multiple forex at the same time, uh, which again provide the solution for working capital uh, into the continent. And I think um, one thing which is very important as well is over the 30 years that Mauritius has developed its financial center, it has been able to put in products and services as well as different regulatory framework, uh, special licenses, for companies to come and get regulated in Mauritius to do business in Africa and in the world. So you have regulations on capital markets, uh, you have regulations for special funds, you know, the newly, newly re uh, adopted regulations are on the variable capital uh, companies, which are, I think, gaining some traction at the moment in Mauritius. Uh, you see uh, the possibility of having captive insurance, family offices, and, and, and in fintech, I think Mauritius has a big role to play um, because there's a lot of fintech operators in Africa for payment intermediation. We've got a very good license, which is a payment service provider, and the newly added Avitus, who was done under the, the aegis of the Ministry of Financial Services, very recently is, is, is attracting people to get regulated. So basically, Mauritius is that point of consolidation, mm. right? It's a point of consolidation for the African continent for channeling of investment, but not only for channeling of industry into the continent, but for companies operating to find the, the solutions in terms of treasury management, in terms of uh, forex, uh, in terms of trading. And I believe um, we'll hear a bit more about that Thank you. from the banks. Thank you, Mahen. Uh, my next question will be to Raoul. When we look at the ecosystem in Mauritius, we see that the banking sector plays an important role. So I think banking contribution in itself contribute to about 7.6% of the, of the GDP. But in a more broader perspective, the bank have been play, playing an important role in uh, this Africa agenda. So how has the, the African banking sector evolved in recent years in terms of its strategic positioning and value proposition? What are the kind of trends and dynamics that you think you know, will shape the African banking sector, and especially from your perspective as a bank that is operating in Africa? Thank you, Shamima. Um, I think I've taken a lot of the time uh, yesterday already to talk about Mauritius and IFC and, and, and the role banks can play to uh, create traction uh, for investment into Africa for, for Mauritius. Um, there is a Latin saying that goes that everything that comes in three is perfect, so I'm going to try and see uh, very, very briefly what I think are the mega trends, and then I can talk about the banking sector. Um, the three mega trends that I would see, and, and you've, you've heard them all during the course of the day yesterday, is all in Africa, is all about demographics and the emergence of a middle class. This is going to create significant opportunities for investment, for consumption, where um, direct investment is going to be crucial. The second one, obviously, is technology, 
and uh, how a young generation of individuals all across a, a continent that is as diverse as Africa are going to use technology to uh, do whatever they need to do. The third one uh, is obviously about regional integration, cross-border trade, and all those corridors that have emerged between Africa and Asia. And yet, again, to quote only three uh, issues that the African continent is facing, is the lack of depth of the capital markets, uh, is issues about financial inclusion, because as the, those economy grows, they do not want to leave people behind, um, and everything that relates around SDG adherence. If you look at Mauritius, and if you look at the banking sector in Mauritius, uh, we have been able throughout the, the past uh, 15, 20 years to create debt. Obviously, you have two, three banks who actually uh, finance the economy and help the economy, have been very helpful, especially the one that I have the honor to, to drive today, and uh, drive financial inclusion, and we've celebrated our 50 year anniversary on the basis of trying to bank the unbanked. Um, so financial inclusion had been at the cornerstone of, uh, of the banking sector in Mauritius, and not just because of SBM, all the banks that have been participating. Uh, you see the frameworks for uh, SDG, Mauritius is probably at the forefront. And the capital markets, although we are a small economy, we have been able to actually create the conditions for uh, diversity in, in the capital markets. So why wouldn't be able to create a value proposition for all investors in Europe, in the United States, in Asia, to leverage on what we have been successful at doing as a small island economy, like the Honorable Minister has mentioned, to facilitate all those investments, to facilitate the trades between Asia, between Africa, through Mauritius, through the quality of the population we've had, and we can talk about it later on. So um, that's what I wanted to mention, Shamima. I think, I think we have all the ingredients. Uh, as a small island, with everything that's been done over the past uh, 55 mm. years since we are a, a republic, uh, to make a difference. Mm. And those countries in Africa who, who are facing the challenge of, of regional integration, who are facing cultural diversity, and are unable to actually um, talk one with another as well as we talk with them, um, should leverage on, on Mauritius and, and our abilities. Thank you. Thank you, Raoul. Um, I'll now turn to, to Nitin. Um, when you look at the Global Financial Index, Mauritius was ranked uh, 68 globally and second in Africa. And we see the competition uh, more and more increasing. So it's not only from the emerging uh, fi financial centers uh, and, and, and the existing one. So how is Mauritius differentiating itself uh, compared to all the other IFCs, and what, what would be, I would say, the USPs of, of, yeah. of Mauritius? Uh, so thank you very much, Shamima. I think that's, that's a very interesting question. I think, um, I think the first comment I have is with respect to really congratulate, I think, the authorities and the private sector for really improving as an IFC with regards to the ranking. I think that's, that's very important. A lot of ground has been achieved. So I think um, that's very interesting. I think the second one is with regards to what you mentioned. Um, I think some people would tend to think that there's competition, but I think we should look really at the law of comparative advantage. So each one has got its own strength. So I think, I think um, a lot of the panelists speak a lot about, you know, the, the Mauritius really being the route between India and Africa. So. Personally, I think it's the time for a couple of reasons. I mean, um, one of them obviously is geopolitical. Um, what we are seeing nowadays is that uh, a lot of countries, big countries, moving away from the dollar. For example, India, uh, you know, trading with other big countries, moving away from the dollar. I think that's going to be a big changer, uh, especially for a lot of African countries. So if I can explain that part. So on one side, you have India, you have China, the big economic powers, and really driving in the years to come, 20, 10 years, 20 years, 30 years time, economic growth. And on the other side, you have the resources, commodities, raw materials, and also energy in the Middle East. So my thinking from Mauritius' perspective is that um, geopolitically, Mauritius is ideally placed as a jurisdiction. And the second one is, um, Mauritius has been working over 20 years with India. 
and on the other part, Mauritius from part of the African continent. So from that perspective, you know, we have the experience compared to other IFCs or regional IFCs, so we, we are there. And I think the uh, most important part is, I think, in terms of growth, uh, the next big growth is going to be in the Indian Ocean. I think everyone seems to uh, question why the Chinese want to be in the Indian Ocean, why the Indians want to be in the Indian, Indian Ocean, and, and maybe the US want to be in the Indian Ocean. But long story cut short, um, Mauritius, you know, um, the future as an IFC, I think there's no question about that. Um, my only concern, I think it's a, it's a good stress, how much Mauritius can capture that market in 10 years, 20 years, 30 years time. So that's, that's my take on it. Thank you, uh, Nitin. Uh, Thierry, I'll now turn to you. I think we, we, we've talked about you know, Mauritius being part of uh, major trading blocks. We've signed a number of bilateral treaties. Uh, we are a member of the um, African Continental Free Trade Area. So we know that the AFCFTA will cover a market of 1.2 billion people, uh, including a growing middle class and a combined GDP of more than $3.4 trillion. So that opens up a lot in terms of trade that will happen in Africa and intra-Africa. So as a bank, um, you see a lot of, of, of questions around trade financing. So where do you see Mauritius positioning itself in terms of assisting, helping into the trade financing in Africa? And, and what are the kind of products that you as a bank would offer to, to clients who are looking for trade financing in Mauritius? Thank you, Shamima. Um, well, I think some of the panelists here also have talked about setting up, I would say, uh, yeah, um, like trade center in Mauritius to facilitate transaction uh, to or from or intra Africa. Uh, nevertheless, yeah, there, there is a, a demand, a strong demand. Uh, well, I travel relatively often into Africa. And when you meet uh, an entrepreneur, uh, uh, old people producing value in their own countries, uh, or trading within the countries or with outside Africa into Africa to serve the growing population and the growing middle class, they definitely have major issues for uh, trading purposes, moving the cash, sometimes because of the problem of currency, but also for a problem of, uh, I would say, having credit with, with a supplier that in developed countries you will have, or you will, have, you will open, a, I would say, a letter of credit, for example, uh, to, to get your goods first, or able to then eventually sell it or nearly sell it, then you pay your supplier. Yeah. That's the, the normal, I would say, uh, cash flow uh, when, when you are uh, a trader in whatever commodities you are trading. Is it in energy, is it in soft commodities, or is it just in uh, consumer goods? Uh, so the, the uh, I would say, uh, banking, product that will help these types of clients will be very often letters of credit or bank guarantees, etc. The problem that they have today, that from Africa, uh, the banks are not able to do so, or if they give a letter of credit, this letter of credit will not be accepted by the, the supplier's bank. So this is where uh, I would say Mauritius has a, a developed banking environment are able to help all these transactions and sometimes you, as a bank we also have need to take, to take securities whenever we give credit etc and uh, for example yeah we, we have developed some capacities in in to take uh, i would say uh, collaterals in some countries for example dealing with what we we'll call soft commodities be it a grain or whatever so that will be stored into a with a collateral agent so these things that we can uh, manage from Mauritius, for example. So by distance, the goods are not in Mauritius. Yeah. But we, are, we, we need at each and every time to be but able to take security. Can be done out of the Mauritius. service can be done. And, and the banking and, and facilities can be done from Exactly. Mauritius. So it's quite, uh, 
The, the different types uh, of uh, facilities will depend on a case-to-case -case basis, obviously. But we, we have banks in Mauritius that, uh, that are used to do that and can do that. Uh, one of the other uh, complications that we can have is the, the foreign currency. Yeah. Um, well, especially since COVID, I would say all Africa has gone under a shortage of currency, all sub-Saharan Africa especially. And uh, this sometimes is a challenge when you have to pay in euro, in dollar, or, or in different currencies, uh, especially in countries where you have uh, out exchange control. So here also Mauritius uh, uh, is here to help these clients. Thank you. So just have to, mind, uh, to piggyback on, on that, you deal with a lot of clients on a day-to-day. -day. Do you have any practical example of you know, what kind of structures should ha would, would have probably been set up in Mauritius to service and to, to, to use those facilities of trade finance or procurement center? Any, anything that comes to mind that you can share with the audience in terms of practical example? Yeah, I think there are quite a lot. If you, if you look at a company like Aspen, for example, which, is, which has its regional headquarters in Mauritius, which manages whole global supply chain, and, and, and um, everybody knows Aspen played a big role during COVID times for production of vaccine. So the production was happening in South Africa, but the whole uh, supply chain for supply to the various countries was actually managed from oh. Mauritius, and they have uh, if I'm not mistaken, around 300 people working in Mauritius, um, you know, to, to manage the global supply chain. Um, and, 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 and the facility that they get with the banks is really the reason why they are in Mauritius. It has nothing to do with taxes, for example. Yeah. They pay the normal tax rate in Mauritius, and they are probably the biggest taxpayer in Mauritius. A lot of people think these, these companies are here because they want to arbitrage in the terms of tax, but that's not the case. Aspen is the biggest taxpayer in Mauritius. And it's known that you have other companies. Aspen is a, is a major um, uh, a company which, which operates out of Mauritius. And you have companies like Huawei, uh, which, which have their regional headquarters for Africa. I mean, the same reason, but also to manage their, re, their, their regional treasury. Uh, a lot of these international companies, they're here because they are able to even deal with African currencies. If I'm not mistaken, the banks offer uh, a trading possibility in 10 different African currencies from Mauritius and including tra trading in hard currencies with euros, USD, etc. So I think there, are a re there is a real value proposition to be here and, and when you talk about this type of structures, we're talking about structure with substance. Yeah. Uh, I mentioned Aspen, people, people uh, Huawei with 350 people, uh, AB InBev from South Africa, uh, uh, who actually have 80 people just to manage the procurement, you know. Uh, the fact that Mauritius is investment grade, uh, all the banks have the same status as investment grade, give a lot of comfort when they have to actually deal with suppliers all over the world. And I think that comfort, that element of security is extremely important. That's why people are here. And we're talking a lot about the ecosystem, uh, but I was mentioning that the, these companies are here and they're employing people in Mauritius because there they are skills and competence available and we must not forget that uh, Mauritius is one of the rare countries where people are perfectly bilingual mm. in English and French. And, and that's, a, that's a major advantage when you're dealing with Africa. Yeah. Most of the countries, we are actually dealing either in English or in French. So I think there, are, there is a lot of advantage for people um, um, using Mauritius. Uh, there are examples, there are case studies, um, and, and it's a tried and tested place for these yeah. type of things. Thank you, Mahen. I think mindful of, of time, I'll probably just have a last question for Raoul and then open up the, the floor for any questions. Sustainable finance and, uh, is something that you know, we all talk about at the moment. Assets in sustainable investment have more than tripled over the past decade due to growing investors' demand and can now be regarded as, as, as a niche market. So green business opportunities in Africa are abundant, and the EU has also committed to invest around 150 billion euros over the seven years towards Africa. So given these promising prospects, how can Mauritius position itself as an impact and sustainable hub for, benefit, for the benefit of Africa? Um, I've tried quickly this morning to gather some figures, um, and it's, this has challenged my my chartered accountancy capabilities because no, nobody speaks the same language when it comes to number. <laughs> um, SDG is indeed a mega trend. Um, 
I, I've read that the, the, the SDG gap, and sorry to read my notes if I can even read what I wrote on, uh, is um, that the SDG gap in Africa is $1.3 trillion. Um, but there is a UN report in 2023 that was published which uh, uh, highlighted that there was a need uh, for investment of 1.7 trillion in Africa for them to achieve their, uh, all their sustainable goals if they want to reach whatever COP number is going mm. to guide their, those investments. Um, Africa has only attracted 550 billion investment in clean energy so far, uh, which if we can try and reconcile, again, through, uh, through an African Development Bank report, uh, highlights that there is a need for more than 100 billion investment a year. Uh, is Mauritius going to be able to attract or to facilitate the, those investments? Certainly not. Um, but we can demystify the fear that investors would have uh, of investing into Africa because, again, as I mentioned yesterday, we are among the very few, if not the only, investment-grade African country, part of SADC and COMESA, which can channel investment. And once, once you have that, uh, and I'm not going to reiterate whatever Honorable Minister has, has mentioned, uh, we are among the, the best countries in terms of GP growth. We, uh, uh, we have more than 10 months reserves. Uh, mm -hmm. As, uh, to, to actually sustain our own um, needs. Obviously, we are on the wait list of the OECD, of FATF, FATCA. We have a bilingual workforce. Um, we have 44 PPAs, correct me if I'm wrong, uh, gentlemen. 24 have been signed with Africa. I mean, there's no question for me. There's no question. We are the best international financial center uh, for the next five or ten years to come. Um, and beyond. Should we probably do the, this promotion here in the UK? Um, if you ask me honestly, I'm sorry to be blunt, probably not. <laughs> we should probably be uh, in Kigali next year during, <laughs> we should probably be in South Africa. Uh, we have to be there. We have to be there. Have and be we are, we are all individually there. I mean, you would see the number of companies who actually go travel to Africa, make the promotion of not just their, their companies. I've been traveling to Africa for the past 17 years. I've never just made the promotion of the company I was working for. Obviously, I have to do it because this is my fiduciary duty. But I make the promotion of Mauritius. We are such a small country which has achieved so, great, so many great things. Um, and we will carry on because we have a very skilled workforce. We, we, are, we actually want to, to create tractions for Mauritius, but we know that because of the size of our market, we can only grow outside. Mm. Um, what we'll be lacking is um, rating. And I, was, uh, I had the chance to, to listen to one of the economic advisors of the Prime Minister uh, Modi last week in Mauritius. It was, was a mind-blowing presentation. Yeah. And um, mind you, the ones who are going to be the next big players in Africa are the Indians. So much so that they've been challenging those big international, uh, as he mentioned, North Atlantic rating agencies. India is going to rate, I don't know if I remember the, the, the figure correctly, I think it's about 25 countries over the next two years. They will give sovereign ratings to African countries. When those countries will have sovereign ratings, whether it is Moody's, uh, Standard & Poor's, or Care Rating, every investor, every banker who is uh, clever enough will actually take this into consideration. Yeah. Care Rating is present in Mauritius. A few banks, a few companies are investors into Care Rating. SBM is a proud investor in Care Rating. So I personally look forward to those things happening because this is going to give significant traction to yeah. investment into Africa. Mm. Yeah. And suddenly we say, well, how come such a small country has been able to do uh, so many great things? Well, it's been 55 years we've been doing great things in Mauritius, so we shouldn't stop. And uh, the Meadows theory, as you rightly pointed out, uh, Mr. Siratan, is, uh, is something of the past. Yeah. We are, and we will be, the next best IFC. I am convinced about it, and I've been, I've been preaching that for the past 17 years, 20 years I've been traveling to Africa. We just need to have faith and we just need to work all together uh, as Mauritians to make this promotion. And I think this is what EDB is doing very well and that's the reason why we, all, we are all here. Uh, I wish we would have had much more people uh, in the room to, 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 to listen to the advocacy we, we, we're doing. But um, 
we are, we are probably the best channel and the best route for investment into Africa. I don't know if Thank I've you. answered the question, but I Thank wanted you. to speak uh, what yeah. I thought. <laughs> Thank you, Raoul, for expressing <laughs> that so clearly. So um, I think we're mindful of time, and I would like to see if there are any questions in the audience. Yeah, want you? Yeah, yes. Yes. I remember some presentations from the Mauritius panel uh, say about 10 or 15 years back, many before us, and then there was a conscious attempt to say that, you know, now we are very much trying to focus on Africa, you know, from being very India-centric to actually moving towards Africa. And now today when I meet people from different countries in Africa, I see people from you know, Tunisia, Egypt, Senegal saying that, yes, Mauritius is our you know, proper center and so on. So do you think that has been achieved that goal of having practically all countries in Africa saying that Mauritius is our preferred center for investment? Yeah. Anyone would like to yeah? No, I think it's a it's a great question, Anuj. Um, and the 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 have we achieved that yet as a financial center? I don't think we've achieved that image yet. But I think, as Raoul mentioned, uh, we are we are we are getting there in the sense that there is a, that concept of shared prosperity, which is extremely important. You know what Mauritius, the role of Mauritius that's, that uh, uh, it's playing at the moment to channel investment. And we're talking about the gap that exists in Africa today. Just on the sustainable energy side, the investment required annually is about $130 billion. And we heard yesterday only 6% of the global FDI is going into Africa, which means that there is a big role for the country like Mauritius to provide the security uh, and the comfort to investors investing in, in, in all these um, uh, new developments should happen. Um, I think we need to do much more work, and I think the EDB is doing a great job to, to, to showcase. We talk about case studies. We have to showcase the companies who are here who are doing real business in Africa uh, through Mauritius and using Mauritius as their base. So obviously, I think we're getting there. I think the other point uh, which I would like to mention uh, when you talk about whether you know there are other financial centers, um, you, you, you asked that question, Shamima. We have been here for 30 years. There are obviously other financial centers in Africa, and I think we should not only think about saying one is competing over the other. Uh, what is the role, the role that Mauritius is playing at the moment uh, would be very different to the role of another financial center. I'll give you an example. Uh, there is the gift city in India. A lot of people are talking about the gift city, which is upcoming. The gift city is about five years old, mm. uh, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, but what we're seeing is we should not talk about Mauritius over the gift city. We should talk about cooperation between Mauritius and gift city, because you can have what we call in the fun world, master feeder structures. A lot of investors prefer with the comfort they have in Mauritius to still invest in a Mauritius vehicle. But we know that there, there are opportunities for funds in Gift City. So why not cooperate? I think that's what we need to think about. Thank you, Mahel. I think there was a question here. Yeah. Sure. Uh, as an international, we're raising an early stage venture capital fund, and we're really uh, pleased to be able to do this from Mauritius. Uh, and I agree with uh, what was said about it being the best jurisdiction to invest into Africa. I have a question that is slightly adjacent to the IFC. Uh, and I want to know what uh, is the panel's opinion in, in terms of policy and in terms of uh, action. What is the Mauritian jurisdiction thinking about in uh, terms of supporting at the grassroots early stage uh, innovative startups? I think there's a huge opportunity that is totally underexploited from what I've seen so far uh, for Mauritius to you know, be a whole co jurisdiction compared to maybe people are doing Delaware or Nigeria now. Mm. Uh, there's also a the, the, you know, with a lot of these innovations being digital, yeah. and also uh, potential for Mauritius to host these companies. Yeah. And it'd be really interesting to see what uh, your thinking is in terms yeah. of uh, being, becoming a startup partner. Yeah. yeah, thank you, Ken. Yeah, 
you will see that the minister talked recently, we launched new structures for fund domiciliation, for example, the variable capital company. Yeah. And that's designed exactly to be a fund of funds where you can have smaller funds geared towards innovators, new investment onto the continent. And the fact that it is protected, each, each of the cells of the funds will have their own uh, identity. So each is protected from each other in, in the sense that you can take a little bit more risk and invest into new emerging uh, companies and investment across the continent. So I think that will be a, fun, a fantastic vehicle and that's why you will see a lot of foundations from the US and Europe and even Asia are looking at structuring new uh, VCC structures in Mauritius geared towards new innovative and smaller companies on the continent. If I can also add maybe just on, on that as well. We know that you know, uh, when it comes to the VC world, usually they would like to have more flexibility and also yeah. in terms of KYC, we have to action quite quickly. So today, Delaware offers them that, that platform and we see a lot of those African VCs are being domiciled in, uh, in Delaware. We are currently in discussion with Avka as well to see what we need to do to improve the ecosystem to make this happen in Africa because we want the, the African VCs to be domiciled in Africa and not in Delaware. So there are discussions around it. We're still at a very early stage with Avka to do that and also with our regulator in, in, in Mauritius. So that the, uh, from a banker's perspective, he would probably be much more uh, securing or reassuring to uh, provide finance out of a Mauritius-based entity than out of a Delaware-based entity, if you allow me. And maybe if I may add one element that we are, we, because we know the story that you can create a company online, uh, but it's not just our, our value proposition, what we're telling the, the, the startups. Uh, who have to go through multiple series of, uh, of investment is one thing that they need to look at very carefully is element of governance. Mm. Uh, you need to do things properly. You need to have governance in the structure. You need to prove the enterprise value to be able to get financing from the banks yeah. or from the private equity players because when you reach series B, it's really growth capital. The private equity will come in. So you need to do things properly around the governance. Mm -hmm. But I get your point. I think what, what's very important, and, and my colleague Natalie and myself, uh, we've been putting a value proposition to the venture capitalist funds to tell them, listen, if you come and, and domicile in Mauritius, we help you. Because these are the funds which are not the big funds. It's not the billions of funds that we've seen. It's about 35 to $40 million. So we need a value proposition they, to, to help them in terms of the cost of doing business. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Because we haven't spoken a lot about yeah. that. Mauritius offers something which is unique, which is the competence, the ecosystem, but the cost of doing business, which is extremely reasonable compared to other financial centers in the world. Yeah. yeah. Any more questions from the audience? No? If not, then I would like to ask Thierry and Nitin, so what would be your last word? What would be the advice that you can give to investors in terms of using Mauritius? Thank you, Shaima. Well, we talk a lot about uh, Africa and uh, I would say business tran flow transfers, etc., uh, be it for VCs or, or companies, etc. There's one aspect of Mauritius that we haven't uh, probably uh, touched base here would have been the jurisdiction of private banking for Africa yeah. and wealth management. Yeah. I think there's also a lot of um, uh, structures that have been uh, introduced in the law of Mauritius to protect the, uh, the wealth of uh, high net worth individuals mm -hmm. throughout the world, but also in Africa. And um, so Mauritius has, has developed a capacity in that sector. So we are banking clients all around the world uh, who are using the, the benefits of the different uh, taxation, uh, protection, uh, trust foundation, uh, so, so all the types of vehicles that we can adapt depending on the needs of each and every one. And, and we are, I would say, uh, delivering services which sometimes are probably even better with some top jurisdiction like Switzerland banks, etc. Uh, so we are quite, uh, I would say, proud of what we can do in Mauritius. And we are probably the only 
private banking jurisdiction within Africa. So I think there's also some good opportunity to do there. And by doing so, very often the entrepreneur, the businessman or whatever, uh, they, they can use Mauritius both for their corporate needs as yeah. well as their private needs. I think this is also something that uh, Mauritius is very appealing for uh, the African countries. Yeah. I think so. there's a great opportunity around mm -hmm. this and especially around succession planning as well because we've seen that the first generation of entrepreneurs in Africa you know, ha is, doesn't have the proper governance, doesn't have a proper structure in terms of succession planning. So all this is linked to succession planning, wealth management, and the corporate uh, vehicle that they would have to manage their own uh, businesses. So, Sp spot yeah. on. <laughs> So, Nitin, yeah. you're, you're um, lost. Yeah, so a couple of words from me. I'm going, not going to be long. I think, I think from, from a practical perspective, um, the good thing to, to note about the Mauritius um, IFC is that you can have corporate vehicles as well as private vehicles. So, I think Cherry mentioned about private vehicle, I mean, wealth management. So, we can do foundations, we can do trust. On the corporate side, we can do typical corporate structures, we can do funds, we can do VCs, we can do a lot of things um, on top of regulated activities and licensed activities for financial services. So I think that's, that's the first step. And I think the second one which is very important is um, someone talk about ecosystem. So when you talk about business, it's really about the life cycle of a business. So you have pre-setting up, you have a setup, you have the operational, and then you have the exit. So I think that's very important. So Mauritius, the IFC caters for all of these. I mean, pre-setting up, um, depending on terms and conditions, you know, ideally you can have your license within two weeks, depending on activity. So I think that's critical for any entrepreneur, business, corporate, funds, and things like that. So, and then in terms of operational, depending on what kind of activity, if you need funding, you need finance, then the, the finance, financiers are here, the banks are here to, to you know, to uplift the company. And when you think about setting up, then you have to think about exit as well. So two types of exit. One is really di divestment, uh, which is quite simple from a perspective, which can be completed within one week, which is not generally the case in a lot of African countries. So this is definitely an advantage. The second one is we also cater for laws with regards to winding up as well. So I think long story cut short, so we do care from the setting up till the company has to exit as well. So I think this is definitely one of the big advantage of setting up Automotions. Thank you. Um, do you still have, do we still have uh, five more minutes? Uh, or I, ha I haven't heard the bell, so I'm assuming we have uh, five more minutes. So um, I'll probably, I'm, I'm not going to ask to Vinay, you know, uh, when investors look at a country where they want to invest or they want to invest through, uh, they look at the laws, they look at the regulations, but they look at the compliance aspect as well, which is yeah. important. And we've seen that you know, Mauritius has been uh, adhering to all the international norms, standard being the OECD, the FATF, uh, with 40 out of 40 of the recommendations. So there's been a journey that Mauritius has gone into yeah. achieving what it, where, where it is today. Mm -hmm. So can you just probably run us through what has been that journey and how have we reached to that level? Because we should also be bear in mind that we, shouldn't, we should still remain competitive while being compliant. Yeah, for sure. Uh, Shaima, uh, the Mauritius IFC over 30 years, three decades, three decades of continuously uh, adjusting to international requirements. Uh, the minister mentioned 1992, uh, we had the Mauritius Offshore Business Activities Act that was launched. And uh, subsequently in 2001, it was changed to the Financial Services Development Act uh, to, uh, to embrace more substance into the jurisdiction to make it more relevant for international business. Then this was further changed in 2007 to the Financial Services Act. And today, uh, what we are doing is that the world is dynamic. There's always new issues that come. Uh, 30 years ago, nobody was thinking about uh, financing of terrorism. These were not the major concerns of global institutions. Today it is. AML, CFT uh, measures are so important in what you do. And uh, so you continuously have to review your policies, regulations, and make sure that also you have enough uh, agencies that are safeguarding whether people are doing you know, the, uh, the right things when money is being uh, transferred from one jurisdiction to another next. And that's the challenge that Mauritius faced. And subsequently what happened, we all know 2020, COVID came, but uh, you know, tough time doesn't come alone. There's always something else attached to it. And we got great listed. 
But the wonderful thing is that in Mauritius, we got out in record times, 14 months. Because we are a small country, small jurisdiction where we work together, the minister mentioned earlier unity and diversity. We work hands in hands, uh, all, the, all the private sector, the public se official, we all work together and we um, adjusted the policies and the guidelines to get out of it. But more importantly, uh, getting out of, of, of the grey list of the Financial Action Task Force, it's about getting everybody on board. It's about proper communication. And I think what Mauritius did well to get out and being fully compliant to the 40 requirements of the FATF, it's about the training and the education of everybody in Mauritius, including the non-banking, non-financial professional service providers, such as lawyers, tax uh, advisors, even traders of precious metals and everything. They all have to adhere to these standards because when they're buying gold from overseas to put in the vault in the Freeport of Mauritius, they have to make sure that they're compliant to AML and CFT requirements as well. So that training, that development, that education went very well. And I think COVID helped us at one stage because everybody was at home and they could join uh, the online training for video conference and, and everything. And, and that allowed everybody to be really, really aware of all the different um, risks uh, pertaining to transaction of funds uh, from one jurisdiction to the other. And that's what Mauritius is doing well, and that's why it's a trusted jurisdiction today, because the population, the professional population in Mauritius is very well educated, and they will make sure that they adhere to the compliance and the KYC is done properly in Mauritius. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you very much. Uh, I think we've reached the end of this uh, uh, session, so I don't know if there's more questions from audience. No? Yeah, no. so I'd like to thank my panelists. Thank you very much. Thank you. Good work.